And we're carrying on our series of Summer of Love. Um, and we're going to look at 1 John 4 together. We're going to look at the points of God is love. We need to accept his love. And then we need to give his love away to others. But first of all, I'm just going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're here. I thank you for your word. And I pray that you would help us hear what you have to say to us this evening. Holy Spirit, come and open our ears and open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, yesterday I had the privilege of being maid of honor at my friend's wedding. It was a beautiful affair. Um, Everybody looked beautiful. There was lots of speeches, lots of dancing. Um, A beautiful day, don't you agree? It was really sunny. Was anyone out in the sunshine as well? No, why? You're shaking your head at me. No, (laughs) but it was just such a beautiful day, and my friend's theme for the wedding was love, which is quite a good theme, you would agree, Um, (laughs) um, and it was from 1 Corinthians 13, where love is, and so at all the table settings, it had love is precious, love is kind, love is patient, and they read 1 Corinthians 13, as is always read at a wedding, Um, and that was the theme of their wedding. But love is so much bigger than we try and put it in. Like, I, I love romantic films. I grew up on all the romantic films. The Sound of Music is my favorite film. Don't judge me. Who else likes Sound of Music? Come on, own up. Yes. I went to Austria and went on the tour and everything. And it's just, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, but those romantic stories always get, particularly women, I'm not being sexist, I'm sure you men like that, but that sort of romance kind of love. But what John is talking about all through his book is this love that is greater than what we think. And first of all, we're going to look at that God is love. Full stop. God is love. And John's saying it's not a characteristic of God. God isn't just loving He is love. And it seems like such a simple statement, but it's so big as well. Um, We can often have views of God. Um, When I was growing up, I became a Christian when I was seven. When I grew up, I knew God, but he was kind of like the person over there who I had to like be nice to, talk to. Um, But I had a mixed up view of who God was. I knew that he loved me, but I also thought that everything, not everything that he did was good. But if God is love, John is saying here that God is love. So that means anything that he does, all the things that he does, comes out of love for all of us. And some of us may not understand that completely, but that is the true image of God. And that's what John starts with, God is love. And that he can be trusted. And if God is love, he sends his love to us. He wants to love us. And one of the most important things to do is to accept his love. And this is what he says in verse 9. No, 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God showed his love first. He didn't wait for us to, for us to show him how much he loved us. How much, I mean, how much we loved him. He gave us his love straight away, no questions asked, just straight away. And my default in life has been that um, you um, you need to be a certain way for someone to love you. So when I grew up, um, I used to be really, really good, so then my parents would love me more, then I'd get more toys, (laughs) they would love me more, I'd get more hugs. That was what my brain did. I thought if I was really good, then I'll get lots of love and all that would come along. Now, I have a story for you. Now, I'm, gonna give, I'm just going to warn you. Do not judge me on this story. <laughs> do not change your opinion of me after this story. Okay, I need you to use your imagination. I am eight years old. I have bigger hair. It's true, it's possible. Bigger hair. So I, there was this one day, and I remember it really, really clearly. I was eight years old. I have two brothers who are a pain. Oh, sorry, were a pain. <laughs> um, they were older than me. They didn't really like me. I was a girl, I was cute, Um, I got all the attention, (laughs) that's maybe why they hated me. Um, And there was this one day when, it must have been the summer holidays, when me and my brothers were at home, and I was happily playing away, my mum called me to to go and do something. Now, I'm quite a calm person now, 
Um, when I was a child, I was, let's say, passionate um, <laughs> and enthusiastic. And my mum asked me to do something for her. And my response was, no. And she got a little bit annoyed and asked me again, would you like to see this? And I was like, nope. And she then dropped the bombshell that was, okay, I like eating food, okay? When I was a child, I ate a lot of food. Like, stupid amount, stupid amount of food. And one of my favorite places to go was McDonald's. Yes. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> a chicken nugget meal. Who else likes McDonald's? All the guys, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> and that was one of my favorite places to be. And so after I had my discussion with my mum, where I said no, and she said, okay, she dropped the bombshell that was this. She said, you are all playing really well this morning, and my plan was to take you all out for lunch to McDonald's. But <laughs> because of your behavior, you are not going. <laughs> I was not happy. I literally stood there like that. Oh, no. And I have to say, I didn't do the really lovely, peaceful thing that um, a children's pastor should do. Um, I went mental. Um, I was so angry that I didn't know I was going to McDonald's, because if I'd have known I was going to McDonald's, I definitely would have said yes to whatever she said. Um, and then she took it from me. So being a lovely child, I <laughs> stomped up the stairs, slammed my bedroom door, and shouted, I hate you, um, and stopped in my room for a little while. Um, and then after a while, I started feeling guilty, a little bit sad, a little bit like I really wanted to go to McDonald's. So I opened my bedroom door, walked down the stairs quite sheepishly, put my head down, and I was like, Mom, I love you. <laughs> um, and then she'd go, yes, yes. And then I'd say, so we're going to McDonald's. And she was like, no. I was like, I hate you. And then I stormed off again. And you'd think that after two attempts that I'd stop. I did it for a whole hour. <laughs> and I can shout. So my brothers, I can still remember their faces. I'd stomp past them on the stairs. They'd be like that. There's so much disgust at me. I went on for an hour trying to persuade my mum that me loving her would be a really good idea for her to take me to McDonald's. And I feel like we can try and do that with God a lot of the time. We can try and earn his love. I didn't realize that my mum, or I didn't really understand that my mum would love me whatever. And me going to McDonald's isn't really a reflection of whether she loves me or not. But with God, I definitely lived as if I needed to earn his love. And that's what a lot of us can do. We can think that we don't deserve the love that he gives. And we can try and prove ourselves. We can be like, okay, if we don't do this sin, I haven't done this sin for like two months, so then God will love me. And then we slip. We go back and we think, oh no, he can't love me now. But that's not what it says in John. It says that God loved us first. Before we did anything, before we said anything, before we did anything. It is a waste of time trying to earn God's love because we can't and we never will. And that is one of the truths that I've had to try and work through. And I think a lot of us try and do every day is try and earn God's love when he's just giving it to us freely because that's who he is. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> if we look at it, it doesn't make sense that God would love us, but he does. And it's a choice every day. I wake up every day and I have to choose to accept God's love because it's there. He hasn't taken it away. It's still there. We just need to accept that it's there. I love that um, in our version of uh, the Bible, it says dear, that John says, dear friends. And in other translations, he calls them the beloved. And somebody pointed this out to me the other day, that it's made up of be loved. If you split them up, it says, be loved. That's what John keeps saying throughout his book is, be loved. Always that reminder. Because it's a choice and we have to accept his love. Just be loved. And so, once we've accepted God's love, that's always there, John then goes on to say something tricky. <laughs> it says, dear friends, since God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. There is the tricky part. (laughs) Not everybody is easy to love. I'm pretty much not easy to love. My brothers found it extremely tricky, especially during the one-hour screamathon um, that I put them through. Um, but John says that if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So it's all well and good accepting God's love for ourselves, but the story doesn't end there. If we don't give it away, then it's pointless. It's not complete. In... Um, If you want to flick to John 13, verse 35, it's on page 1021. It says this. This is Jesus. And 34. It says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's a challenge, but it says that is how God will be known when we love one another. That should be what stands us out from everybody else. When no one else is loving, when no one else is reaching out, that's what we should be doing. That's how God should be known. And like I said, it's, it's tricky to love other people, and especially putting other people first. God showed us the most amazing example. God gave his son, and that son then gave up his life for us. It's sacrificial at every level. Um, I learned about this type of love when I was at university a long time, a very long time ago. Um, I went to university in Plymouth. Anyone from Plymouth? No? Oh, you should go. It's a great place. Um, And I was part of the Christian Union there. And one of our things that we had to do was that we served tea and coffee to people after they finished partying in the bar. So we'd work from about midnight until about three, serving tea and coffee to people. Now, a little heads up, serving hot tea and coffee from an urn (laughs) with drunk people is not the best idea. Um, But it was definitely a place where we, we talked to people. Often they were drunk, so they would share a little bit more of their lives. And at first, I loved doing that. I love people. I'm an extrovert. I love tea. It all worked out quite well. But after a few months, I started to get tired of it. I started seeing the people, and I was like, do you know what? It's your own fault. You're drunk. You've had 20 drinks. You've just thrown up in the corner. You've just eaten a tea bag. Um, <laughs> that happened a lot. <laughs> I don't know why. And I wasn't enjoying it. And I remember someone telling me that if you, if, you get, if you start getting grumpy about things that you're doing for people, that you should ask God to break your heart for, the, for these people. And I remember praying the prayer. It was, it was at a Christian union. I was like, yeah, God, that would be really great if you could, yeah, make me love these people, whatever. Kind of a really half-hearted prayer. And I was definitely not prepared for what happened after I prayed that prayer. Um, it is a dangerous prayer to pray. But it was transformational. So um, we were serving coffee, two in the morning. And I still remember it. There was this one guy called James. And he was very chatty. He, he didn't eat a tea bag. <laughs> He's one of the normal people. Um, and he started telling me about a story, about something that was going on in his life. Um, his mum was diagnosed with cancer. And he would come every week and he would tell us how much he needed God to make her better. And we'd pray with him, and he'd pray, and he'd pray as well. Um, and then after I prayed this prayer, I can still remember him coming to see me, and he was like, Jess, I can't do it anymore. And he started to cry, and I felt, like, ridiculously upset for him. And it's something that I've never been able to shake off again. Um, and God did break my heart for him. And... Every week he would come and every week we would talk about his mum and every week he would ask God to heal her. And there is no way that I could have done that without asking God to give me love for him and for all the other people that came. And at the end of the year, his mum came to visit and his mum was free from cancer. And yeah, it's amazing. And if we hadn't prayed and if, if we hadn't prayed for her, then she wouldn't be able to be there. And it's 
being brave enough to ask God to break your heart for people, there are probably lots of people in your life who God has been like, you should really love that person. Someone at work, you know that really annoying person, you should really love that person. And you've gone, I'd rather not. I'd rather be really nice to that person over there because they give me free cake on a Tuesday. Um, But there's a reason for it. There is a reason why I needed to love the people at my uni so that they could meet God and they could know who he is. But it's a pretty tricky prayer to pray. But it completes the cycle that God is love and he loves us and then we have to love other people so that they they know who he is. James learned who God was because we loved him. And his mum now knows who God is because we love James. So we're meant to be together. That completeness is supposed to happen. I'll read it again. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So there's sacrificial love at every turn. God shows us what that is and then we have to do it. But there's also choices at every point of the way. That God is love, we need to choose to accept that that is true. That God is love, that he won't let us down, that he is trustworthy. And we have to accept his love. We have to accept that, yeah, there is nothing we can do to make him love us more. And there is nothing that we can do to make him love us less. And then we need to choose to love those around us who are really tricky to love, but who God calls us to love. I'm just going to ask the band to come up, actually. Matt? Or just Matt? I know all of you. Sorry. (laughs) Change my word. And I've been on a journey with those three things. I'm not there (laughs) at all. But it's the choices that we have to make each of each and every time. The time when we're going through something in life and it feels like God isn't there and feels like we have no one to cling to, we need to remember that God is love, that he is there when we turn to him. And when we feel like we're not worth anything, when we're having one of those days where we're just like, I can't do this anymore, That's the time when we have to accept that God loved us first. That he stepped out to us before we had to do anything. And then when we look around at people that we work with, that we live with in our community, and we're like, what am I supposed to do with this? It's then that we need to ask God to break our hearts for those people. Because those people are his children as well, and they need to know his love. I'm just going to ask the band to tinkle. Um, Because I I was listening to God before speaking, and I really feel like there are three responses for all of us and those choices. And we can make the choices today, and we can make them again next week. But if there's one of those that has touched your heart or one that you've gone, do you know what? I need to know more of that. Then now is the time to do it. Now is the time to choose. So I'm just going to encourage us all to stand up and do this together.